Amen. 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 So well, some folks are missing, Will. There's always one God had just the disciples together that super some special things happen. Amen? Amen? And so God's got his disciples here. Right? I'm one of them. You are as well. Amen? Amen. The Holy Amen. Spirit's here, and he's going to minister to our needs. And so let's let God have his way. And Others may be on their way, but it is good to be in the house of the Lord. Genesis chapter 6, and one verse of Scripture, verse 8. And then we're going to ask Reverend Walker if he'll pray for the service. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And with the help of the Lord, I'd like to minister on the title of the message, Finding Grace or Finding Favor. Reverend Walker, sir, would you please pray? Thank you, Lord Father, this evening for such a time as this, for drawing men and women out to your house. I ask now that you would usher the man of God at first, that you would lead God, direct him, make preaching easy, send forth your word, soften hearts, give us our ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord has to say to the church, and we thank you. We honor you, we praise you for us in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who is in Christ. Praise his name. Amen. Amen. I want to encourage you also, grab some church cards. Reach out to your neighbors. Reach out to people around you. Develop a habit of inviting people to church. Amen. Why is that important? Well, God wants to save the lost. Amen? Amen. And if we develop a habit, a habit of inviting people to church, God will send people by our way that want to go to church because he knows we're going to invite them. Right? It's just that simple. The Lord wants to save them. He's looking for a usable vessel to do it. And so he's looking for that one that's not so wrapped up in their own world, in their own life, that they're too busy to reach out and invite somebody. And so let's develop a, a habit. Maybe I say three a day. You can do more than that. But the point is to have a mind to invite. And so God will send people by your way and go, oh, I need to invite that person. And that's, what, that's how it works. It's real simple. And so let's endeavor to do that, and God will bless. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8. Finding grace. Say that with me. Finding grace. Finding grace. Finding grace. Finding grace. In this sixth chapter, and really picking up in verse 5, the story starts that we want to discuss this evening, this historical account. It said, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Notice the thing that's focused on here. The actions wasn't what God really focused on. It was the heart. He says, Every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. What a dark state of affairs the world was in. When every thought that they had was evil. You know, some, you know, people have thoughts. Sometimes they're up, sometimes they're down. Sometimes they're happy, sometimes they're sad. But in this case, every thought was evil. Every thought, every imagination of thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And I firmly believe that, that, the, re, that the way you get like that is when you find yourself with a lack of gratitude in your heart. And you don't realize that there's a great big loving God that, that, that loves you, that made you, and has a plan for your life? Because that's how you get in that condition. Well, the world's against me. Life stinks. Well, life is difficult because we're in a fallen world. But we're not living for this fallen world. We're just passing through. Our treasures yeah. laid up somewhere beyond the blue. But he said every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. We have to fight against this way of thinking. We have to fight against this mindset. The Bible says in verse 6, He repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. Since the thought, since every thought, imagination of thoughts of the, of the hearts of man was evil, it grieved the heart of God. God always looks on the heart. God always looks on the heart. So what someone would say, is God concerned with the outside? Absolutely he is. But it starts in the heart. If the heart's right, then, we'll, do you want, then the outside will be affected. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen? amen. It's just the way that it is. It's a natural byproduct. When our heart is in a right way towards God, we begin to make certain decisions that are consistent with a right heart. And that's just the way that it is. And, and the evidence is there. But it, it focuses on the heart. And it's very interesting. Uh, I was listening to Pastor Keckel, and uh, he was actually kind of dealing with this as well, talking about it's the things within a man that defiles a man. I was listening to him this morning. It was a real blessing. But so God's heart was grieved. And the Lord said, I will destroy a man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, the fowls of the air, for repenteth me that I have made and made them. And so he's, God was, mankind had got to a place where they were past redemption. It's possible to get to that place. The Bible calls it a reprobate heart. It's not my prayer that anybody reaches that. If you're under the place where you feel like maybe you've gotten there, you wouldn't even be in the house of God today. You wouldn't even be here. So if you're here today, let's dispel that mindset that you've hit that place. God still loves you and he's still working in your life. Amen? Amen. Because somebody's reprobate wants nothing to do with the Lord. 
Okay, so take that, take you out of that battle right out the gate. In verse 8, it says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Grace comes when we look beyond ourselves, when we look beyond our own abilities. Jesus made this statement in Matthew 7, 7 through 8. He said, Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. Now notice that statement. Everyone that asketh receiveth. If you ask in faith, you will receive. Amen. Done deal. Hallelujah. Will you receive tonight? Maybe. Will you receive tomorrow? Maybe. I don't know when you'll receive, but you will receive. Amen. Every man gets what, they, what they're looking for. And as one man put it, but not all like what they get. <laughs> People get what their heart wants and they go after it, but they don't always like the end result. But when we, get, but when we ask God for something, when God gives us something, it, there's no regret with it. It's good. It's right. It's holy. It's pure. It, the best things in life are the things that God gives us, the gifts of God. Amen? Amen. And so he says, ask and you shall receive. He says, seek and you shall find. He that seeketh shall find. And to him that knocketh, it shall be open. Notice these are absolutes. We will receive, we will find, and it will be open unto us. God will open doors. God will make a way. If you want to go to heaven, God will make a way for you to get there. If you want to be right with God, God has made a way for you to be right with God. If you need whatever it is you need from the Lord, God has made a way. Are you faith, do you have the faith to trust God that he'll, God, God will perform it in his due season? That is the question, but God will do it. He said, let us therefore, in Hebrews chapter 4 and 16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. I love that. This word grace means this, it means graciousness. It means kindness or favor, objectively. Favor, grace, plenty, precious, well-favored. And as we, did, we, as we described it in the New Testament, the divine influence on the heart, its reflection in the life. But this word here that we're referring to here in the Old Testament, it means favor. That Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Now notice what it says here in these next couple verses. It says, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Now that's interesting. Notice in the order of things in the word of God, it says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And then it describes Noah. Notice how grace is placed before Noah's works. Noah, how, notice how great Noah. Noticed Noah. Notice how grace is referenced first. See, we can't even live right without grace. Amen. We can't even do right things without the grace of God. Why is that? Well, it's quite simple. Because if, the, if we are not divinely influenced in our heart, then our actions will be tainted. We'll live holy. Why? Quote, unquote, holy. I use it in a loose sense. So that we can impress others with how holy that we are, like the Pharisees did. We'll live in a form of righteousness, but it'll be a source, a source of pride and kind of a banner of ego. But when we come to God and we look to the Lord and we trust in God because we've been influenced by divine grace, then our attitude towards God is doing it out of, a, out of an attitude, a, a position of gratitude. See, we can't earn our way into heaven. None of us is good enough on our own. And as I said before, and as it's been said by many others, heaven is perfect. Only perfection can go there. And if we're not perfect, we can't go there. So we have a problem. How many want to go to heaven? Amen. Amen. And if we're not perfect, how can we go there? The answer is grace. The answer is the love of God, the grace of God. Jesus Christ, he shed his blood on the cross of Calvary. He paid the price for the punishment for our sin. We deserve to be punished because of sin. But Jesus paid the price because sin has to be punished. Transgression has to be punished. See, I wasn't, it wasn't my plan to be born. I, I didn't choose to be born this way, preacher. I, I wasn't, it wasn't my plan. Maybe not. But the fact is that there is a law written down in heaven and sin has to be punished. And if there's sin in our life, it has to be punished. Whether you earn that punishment or not. If, the, if, if there's an infraction, there must be a punishment. If you, uh, if you speed down the highway and it isn't, and you didn't even intend on doing it, you didn't know what the speed limit was, you're still going to get a ticket. The police officer has to give you a ticket or has to hold you accountable because if he doesn't, then everybody else can speed. 
There has to be a ju- there has to be justice, so to speak. And so we deserved hell, but Jesus took the punishment. He took the beating so we could be set free. And so he gave us this gift called grace. And so if heaven is perfect and only perfection can be there, then if we're not perfect, we can't be there. So God had to resolve this problem. So he resolved it through his son. So when we accept what Christ did on the cross, we accept Jesus as the punishment that Christ went through for us. And we say, Lord, I accept what Jesus did in my stead, then his righteousness is imputed unto us. When the Father looks down, he sees the righteousness of Christ in us, and therefore that makes us fit to go to glory, because when God looks down upon us, he sees the righteousness of the Son. And then from the day we accept Christ into our life, from that day onward, God begins to work at work his good work in our hearts and his life. In our lives, he begins, to be, he begins to be formed in our hearts and in our minds. And we begin to become more and more like Jesus each and every day. As we move further up and further into the grace of God, as we get closer to God, as we become more and more like him, for we are his workmanship, created, and created unto good works in Christ Jesus. It's a process that starts when we put our faith in God. Amen? Amen? Amen. God is good. Amen. Amen. And so when we put our faith in God, the process begins. But notice here that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord first. And because he found grace, then the results followed. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation. And Noah walked with God. Are you walking with God? It's a question each one of us have to ask ourselves. Are we walking with God? Or are we just drifting through life? Are we walking with God or are we just walking after the course of this world? After its fashions and after its lusts and after its passions. Who are we walking? What are we walking after? Are we just walking after the imaginations of our heart? Or are we walking with God? Say, Pastor, you might ask the question, how does one walk with God? First, you have to meet him. First, you have to meet him. You have to be born again from above. You have to ask him to come and abide in your heart. And he will do just that. You have to repent of your sin and ask Jesus to come on in. Repent of your sin. You have to acknowledge it. The word sin means to miss the mark. You have to acknowledge that you've missed the mark. We've all missed the mark. We've all missed the mark. Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And we have to acknowledge that and say, God, that I cannot be the man or the woman you've called me to be. By myself, I need some grace. I need some help. I need you to divinely influence my heart. You know, the other day, Reverend Kinson was trying to help me out with the database. And uh, what's that? It's a way we, it's a, it's a tool that we use. And we call it the fishing net to try to make sure we can pray for people and keep track of folks. And we don't want anyone to go to hell. We want everyone to make it to heaven. Amen. And so uh, we have, this, we have a, a database we put up that just keeps track of people and tries to help us as pastors to, to pray for people and ministers to pray for people and be there for each other. And he was trying to teach, he was trying to share some stuff with me. And, and there, was a, there was a mental block. Have you ever had a mental block? Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. He was trying to share something. He was trying to help me. And I was not understanding what he was trying to say. Because we're different people. And he loves me, I know he does. But I was having a hard time trying to understand You know, sometimes we need some grace to understand. Amen? Amen. Sometimes we need God to open our hearts. God, help me understand what the man of God's trying to say. Lord, give me the heart of what's going on here. Help me understand, Lord, more importantly now what he's trying to say, but what you're trying to say through the fellow. Amen? We need God to talk to our hearts. We need God to make the difference. We need the grace of God. Lord, I want to walk with you. I want to talk with you. If I'm the only one on the face of the earth that does that, Lord, I want to be somebody that walks with Jesus. I want to be somebody that walks with Jesus. And so in this situation, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And and the word of God goes on and shares some more things. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And he begins to give him this decree. He says, make thee an ark of gopher wood. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark. Then shall pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. It had three different stories. This big old giant boat. And I'm not going to take all the time to just flesh out what the, how big this thing was. This massive boat. But nothing had been built like it or before. And God said, I want you to build it. And God said, I want you to be, I want you to follow me. I want you to live for God. And you say, well, no one's ever done it in my family. No one's ever done it in where I'm from. But who's going to be the first one to build an ark for their family? 
Who's going to be the first one to build an ark for their, for their platoon? Who's going to be the first one to build an ark for their unit? Who's going to be the first one to say, you know what? Today's a day that somebody in this, somebody stands up for God. It's going to be me. I'm going to be what God wants me to be. Amen? Amen. I need God. And you know, and if you're going to do it, you need something. You know what you need? You need grace. You need grace. We can't do it on our own. We need God's grace. And it's important that we have God's grace. Because when God helps us, then when people ask you, how did you do it? You'll say, it was the grace of God. It was the grace of God. There won't be any ego. There won't be any pride. You won't say, I'm a self-made man. Reverend Torres was kind of touching on this last night. You'll say, it happened because God helped me. It happened. It happened because. And first of all, God had to believe in us. By bringing us to the house of God and sharing the word of the Lord with us. So he could reach out and touch our hearts so we could begin to walk after him and not walk after the world. And so he's told Noah, make an ark. In other words, live like Jesus. You might say, Noah look, or looks around and goes, yeah, right. Who's going to do that? How's that going to happen? I've got no example. See, nobody can live. That's, that's what the devil says. Nobody can really be a Christian. Well, we live in a fallen world, preacher, and you know how crazy this world is. And you're, you're crazy to think that somebody can actually be a Christian. Somebody can actually live right. Why, this world's crazy. This world's all, there's no, nobody can do that. Uh, yes, they can. Yeah. Nobody can do it on their own. But we can do it with the grace of God. Amen. We can do it with the grace of God. Make an ark by grace. And so the process began. He had some help. He had some boys that were going to help him. And I remember, maybe there's many times these boys wanted to do something else. They wanted to go somewhere else. They wanted to be about something else. No doubt, uh, this took a long time, about 60 to 70 years. I'm sure there was a couple of days they woke up and said, I don't really want to do this. I still remember many years ago when I was a young kid, and I told my dad, I said, Dad, Sunday morning rolled around. I said, Dad, I don't feel like going to church today. Some of you know what, have heard this story. He said, what if God didn't feel like taking you to heaven? And that was the last time I said that. Been going to church ever since. <laughs> Had a little partner there when I fell, fell away in the, in the military until somebody came by and invited me to church. Amen? Amen. And I prayed for salvation in my barracks room. But thank God for God's goodness. Thank God God wants us to go to heaven. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. And so Noah had to begin to build this. 60 to 70 years, his boys had to help him. One might come by, what are you doing having your kids waste their time building this massive wooden uh, edifice out in the middle of the desert uh, or wherever it may have been? Uh, what, what, what is going on with you having the, to have them build this? What's the point? I remember years ago, I was reading a story about this farmer that had a big old field, fields full of corn and, and he had way more corn than he needed. And, and somebody walked by and he said, why are you wasting your boys' time having them farm all this corn. Why are you having them work on this corn? You don't need all this corn. He said, I'm not building a farm. I'm building boys. I'm building these men. I'm making something out of them. And God's called us to be more than we are. Amen? And if we're going to have to live, if we're going to live different in heaven than everybody else, then we, in, in the glory, we have to live different now than everybody else. Are you listening? Yeah. If we're going to go to heaven, the multitude isn't going there. The minority is. The few be there that find it. How many want to go to heaven today? Amen. Amen. If we want to go to heaven, then we're going to have to walk differently than the world walks. And so the word of God tells us here that he told him to build this ship by grace. Now this is not a foreign concept to the people of God. For Jesus also, by the grace of God, grew. When he was a young child, the Bible says this concerning Jesus. And the child grew and waxed strong in the spirit filled with wisdom and grace, of, and the grace of God was upon him. The Holy Spirit and the grace of God helped our Lord as a child to grow up, to become the man that God would use him, and that God had called him to be, because he was 100% man, 100% God. He needed the grace of God. Amen? Amen? The divine influence upon the heart's reflection in life. The Apostle Paul made the statement, but by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. And so he said, even everything that I did, all the progress, the churches that were established, the work that was done, it was done because of the grace of God. It was the grace of God that got him out of bed. It was the grace of God that caused him to preach. It was the grace of God that caused him to write a majority of the New Testament. It was the grace of God that propelled him and moved him into everything that he did. We need God's divine influence upon our life if we're going to do the things God's called us to do. And then finally also he says this concerning us. We perform when we rest in his grace. Wherefore we receive a kingdom which cannot be moved. 
Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Grace is the answer for our lives today. You don't come to God. You know, as I was talking to Brother David, he's inviting somebody to church. So it's like, I need to get my life straightened up before I go to church. It doesn't work that way. You come to church so God can just, can give you grace so he can straighten your life out. Amen? Amen. Amen? If you could do it on your own, you wouldn't need church. We would, this, we wouldn't be, this wouldn't be necessary. You, but we need each other. We need a body of believers. Say, Brother Rossi, I don't. I can just read my Bible on my own. You need to read your Bible on your own, but we need a church. We need a fellowship. Up to every time I get a chance to listen to the overseers that are over me, I'm reminded of just by as I listen to them, as they preach, I'm reminded what a blessing it is to have someone to preach to me. And so we need each other. We need the grace of God. The grace that brings us through. And so he began to build this ark for over 60 to 70 years. He began to bring these animals in, two by two and seven by sevens. He brought them in. And the word of God tells us in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second year, in the second month of the 17th day, the same day where all the fountains of the great deep broken up, the windows of heaven were opened, and rain was upon the earth 40 days, and the self same day entered Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And the sons of Noah, and Noah's wives, and three wives, and his sons, them, into the ark. And so he brought them in. In verse 16 of chapter 7, it says, And they went in, went in male and female of all flesh, and as God commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. You know, God can shut us in grace. He can shut us in, a, in, a, in that protective area, and he can take care of us. When COVID hits, God can protect us. Amen? And God did. When difficult, when financial struggles come our way, God can protect us. When we don't know when uncertainties come our way, God is there. God protects his kids. God protects his children. God does all things well. When we don't know what to do, God can open a door, bring somebody by our way, provide a job opportunity, or, or just open the door for us in a, in a way we never could have imagined. God does all things well. By the grace of God, God knows how to move as a master chess, chess player. He moves the pieces around and blesses his kids. And blesses his kids. And so we see in this situation that God shut them in. It was God that closed the door and sealed it. It was God that made the pitch and the wood hold. As the water and the fountains of the deep opened up, and as that ark began to be lifted up off the face of the ground, and for 40 days and 40 nights, rain and storms plummeted, and the fountains of the deep were opened, and the waters began to pour out all throughout the world, and lifted up that ark above the highest mountain, there about above the, the Himalayas and above the highest mountain peaks, and Noah and his family, as there was a storm all around and as there was chaos all around and there was death and destruction all around they were safe inside of God's ark they were safe inside of God's ark and it was God's grace that held the ark together it was God's grace that kept it from leaking they had no place they could have go they could go if there was problems with this great ship but God kept it together God sealed them in God kept them safe God made it made a way and it was by the grace of God that they sailed on it was God's grace. Noah wasn't in that boat going, yeah, I'm really a good shipbuilder. For he had no one to compare it with before him. He was the first one to build an ark. And the last one to build one like this. But he built it as God told him, and God made the difference. God's looking to you, he's saying, I want you to build. I want you to work. He said, work out your own salvation of fear and trembling. We're saved by the grace of God, but now that we're saved, there's some things we got to do. We have to develop that faithful church habit. We have to develop Bible reading. We have to find a place to pray. We need to be about the Father's business. We need to develop a life that will, that will help massage and bless the grace of God that God's worked in our lives. Amen. It's a habit. It's a pattern. It's a, it's a system that works. God blesses. God meets the needs. And so the Bible says this. Jesus speaking in John 14. He said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And so while they were in there in that ship, I don't think they were afraid at all. With all the storms going on outside and all the death and destruction around them, I believe without a shadow of a doubt that there was peace inside that ship. There was peace inside that boat. They were sitting there going, Dad, I get why you told us to do this now. I get what this was all about. 
I understand what's happening now. Thank God their families were spared. Their lives were spared because they built an ark as God had instructed them to do so. And God was the one that made that ark float. And I just love what he says here as we begin to move on a little bit more into this. And, and it's really powerful. So verse 7, I already read to you chapter, or chapter, or verse 11 out of chapter 7. I'm going to read it one more time. One more time just for the sake of, just for the sake of what we're trying to share here. In the 600th year of Noah's life in the second month, of the seventeenth day of the month, the same day where all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened up, were open. And rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. Well, after those forty days and forty nights, the rain stopped, but the earth was still full of water. The earth was still full of water. And the word of God tells us what happened. And I'm gonna jump down here into the next, I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit if God will help us. And the Bible says in verse 5 of chapter 8, And the waters decreased continually until the tenth month. And the tenth month on the first day of the month were the tops of the mountains seen. And it came to pass in the end of forty days that Noah opened the window of the ark, which he had made, and he sent forth a raven, which went forth to and fro, and the waters were dried up from off the earth. And so he sent forth this raven, and the raven didn't come back. Why didn't the raven come back? Because Brian replaced the land. It didn't come back because it was eating. Yep. What, do, what do ravens eat? Carcass. Dead things. All the dead animals and dead creatures and dead human beings. God, he sent out the raven and the raven was feasting. The, these, these, uh, these animals were eating up all the carcasses. When Noah and, then, Noah and his family came out of this ark, it was going to be a clean new earth. It was going to be a clean new earth. And so they was out there flying around. It didn't come back. And he also sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from out the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot. The dove wasn't going to rest on floating bodies. And so the dove came home. And she returned unto him into the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then put forth his hand and took her and pulled her in unto him, unto the ark. And so the dove returned. The Holy Ghost was saying... Stay in the ark. Stay in the safety zone. Stay where you're at. Rest. Everything's, just, everything's good. Just stay where you're at. And so the dove came in, came back. And the word of God tells us, and he stayed yet another seven days. Again, he sent forth the dove out of the ark. The dove came in to him in the evening. And lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. He knew that they were going down. The waters were going down. There was evidence that the waters were going down. Can you imagine just looking out and seeing nothing but water and not even knowing how this is all going to develop? But the same God that told him to build the ark was the same God that gave him, and the faith that caused him to do it was the same faith that took away the anxiety and the pain and allowed him to have peace amongst the storm. See, we have to follow God now so that we'll be able to follow God later. We have to trust God today so we can trust God later. Right now, God's preparing you for what's going to come. And if we'll trust God now, we'll be able to trust God later. And we'll be a strong per You'll be a strong individual. You'll be an anchor in the storms of life. But, when, when, but the thing is, we need to start trusting God. Amen? Amen. We need to make up our mind. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm, the first time I did it on my own, it didn't work out. But this time, I'm going to do it God's way. I, I remember the day I got saved in that barracks room, and I walked out of that room. I said, from here on out, Lord, I'm going to go where you want me to go. I'm going to do what you want me to do. I'm going to say what you want me to say. There was no preacher there, but there was a preacher called the Holy Ghost. I made a commitment to God that day, and that brother came and invited me out to church. And ever since then, I've never forgot those words. Lord, I'm going to go where you want me to go. I'm going to do what you want me to do. I'm going to say what you want me to say, and I do everything I can to follow his lead, follow his guide. If he doesn't tell me not to say something, I try not to say anything. I try to follow his lead. And from that day forward... God brought me to a church, and I heard the word of God. I said, Lord, I'm going to do it your way this time. I'm going to do it your way this time. I'm not going to do it my way. Because we don't know the future. Right. We don't know what tomorrow holds. Amen. We don't know when God's going to wrap this thing up. It could be tonight. He could call us home before this service is over. We need to be, we need to be in the ark with God, in the fa ark of faith. And so he tells us here. He sent out this dove. Let me, see, let me read it again. He stayed yet another seven days. Sent forth the dove, which returned not again unto him anymore. The evidence was there. And it came to pass in the 600th 
and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried, dried up from off the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark, and he looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the seventh and twentieth day of the month, was the earth dried. What do we see here? And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of the flesh, both of the fowl, of the cattle, every creeping thing. I'm going to move down here for the sake of time. He said, Every beast, every creeping thing, every fowl, and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kind went forth out of the ark. And so they came out of the ark. When did they come out of the ark? One year and ten days later. They were in that boat for one year and ten days. Talk about a deployment. Talk about a deployment. That was an expeditionary force for sure, wasn't it, Clay? They're out on that ship for over a year and ten days. God took care of them. And then when it finally settled there on that mountain, they came out. They came out. And I just want to share this before I move along. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost... Whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things. Bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you. The Holy Spirit's here right now. And it was that same Holy Spirit that kept them in that ark. That kept them in the ark. Can you imagine? Are we ever going to get out of here, Dad? What, 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 how long are, will we be in here? Maybe they said, maybe they were looking at the food, so the food sources and wondering what's going on. And how much longer do we wait? And you know, maybe they were starting to run out of certain clean animals. I don't know. Because they had a certain amount that they could eat, and they had a certain amount that, but you know, you never know what kind of thoughts that come into the mind of an individual. We all deal with those thoughts from some time, from time to time. Things that just kind of try to take away and rob us of our peace. But see, the Holy Ghost will sustain us. The Holy Ghost will give us the peace that we need. The Holy Ghost will say, "No, you did the right thing. You did what I told you to do. You're going to be okay." And so, when they finally came out of that ship, when they came out of that ship after a year and ten days of being at sea. The first thing that Noah did was what? The first thing that Noah did was build an altar unto the Lord. Yes. The first thing he did, he said, you know what? The first, the way this new world's going to start off is worshiping God. Yes. Worshiping God. It was grace that brought me through. It was grace that brought me through, and I think Amazing Grace, the song didn't exist back then, but I think Noah would tell you, through many dangers, tolls, and snares, we have already come. It's grace that's brought us safe this far, and grace will lead us home. He would say without any hesitation, it was the grace of God that put it in my heart to build this thing. It was the grace of God that touched my boys' hearts to help me build it. It was the grace of God that gave us women that would back us up as we did it. It was the grace of God that kept the boat together. It was the grace of God that kept peace inside the ship for over a year and 10 days and all these animals and all these animals as they were in there he built an altar he took of every clean beast of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar what a, what a sacrifice what an offering he didn't do it because, because he was forced to do it he did it because he was influenced by the grace of God he did it because he was influenced by the grace of God. And this is what God wants from us. He doesn't want me to come down and force you to live for Jesus. But he wants you to get influenced and touched by his grace to where you say, God, thank you, Lord, for a second chance. Thank you, God, for washing me. Thank you, God, for forgiving me. Thank you, God, for cleansing me. I want to live a life for you. I want to offer my life as a sweet-smelling savor unto you. I want to be a living sacrifice for God. I want to do what God wants me to do because God has taken care of me. God made a way. Yes. The Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything as I have done while the earth remain as seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. Notice we started out with the heart of man and the heart of God. And here we end with the heart of man and the heart of God. God saw a man that would worship him. And God smelled a sweet smelling savor. And God's looking for some people that will worship him. That will live for him. And God will smell a sweet smelling savor. And God will look at your life. And God will bless it. Because God wants to continually hear us praise him. There's two things God's looking from us. He wants to use us to reach the lost. He doesn't want anyone to go to hell. He doesn't want anyone to die and miss out on eternity. He wants everyone to go to heaven. He's called us to do that. But he's also looking for some true worshipers. He's looking for some true worshipers. And God's looking to you today to be that one. 
that will worship God as my wife begins to make her way to the piano. He was preserved by grace and he worshiped by grace. And he would say throughout the years, maybe his grandkids were born. Let me tell me, great grandpa Noah, what happened? He would say it all happened because of the grace of God. Because I found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Because God gave me favor. Why me? I have no idea. But he loved me and he cared. He cared about me and he protected my family. And the word of God says this as I close. Even when we, even when we were dead in sins, he hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Jesus, through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself is the gift of God. See, God wants to divinely influence your life today with a thing called grace. He wants to begin to work in your life in a special way. But before that can happen, we have to come to God and say, Lord, I don't know what the future holds. I don't know what floods may come my way. I need to build my life in the manner you want it built. None of us can make it on our own. We can't get to heaven on our own. Why would we stop and think that we can make it in this life on our own? Amen? We need God's grace. And the first person, as soon as a man or woman realizes that, that's the first time they start to be wise. That's when they really start living. When they realize it, it, we are what we are by the grace of God. Amen. His heads are bowed and eyes are closed and no one's looking around. By the grace of God, faith in the grace of God, a man or a woman overcomes.